your fans and students. My name is Lenady Hanau and I'm so excited you're here with us today. Welcome to Inside Broadway's Careers in Theater video series. I'm so excited because we have a very special guest today. So before we introduce her, as you know, when you go to see a Broadway show or any show, the curtains open, boom, the show starts, right? And the actors are ready to go. But before the actors come in, there are many, many, many crew members that are there hours before preparing to make sure that everything is perfect and that the show is perfect. And one of those amazing crew members are here today, Darcy Kane, who is in the wardrobe department of Moulin Rouge. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm of very course. excited. We're very excited to learn about your career and everything that um, entails being in the wardrobe department, also a designer. She's and a stagehand, which we'll find out later on. She's incredible. So, what do you do in the wardrobe department? So, in the wardrobe department, we all wear a lot of different hats, but kind of all encompassing working with clothes, costumes, and actors. There are things like day work, where we'll come in four hours early or just for a four hour call to steam everything, put dry cleaning back together, because things that you don't know are uh, brooches can't be dry cleaned, so we, we sniff them off the costumes, otherwise the finish will get ruined by the chemicals, and then day work sews them back on, and then just make sure everything is prepped for the show. We check closures, we do hooks and eyes, zippers, um, is the hem torn, is anything like somehow stained, and that's what the prep calls do, as well as shoe calls, where we just make sure everything is safe, everything is rubbered, um, nothing's falling apart, and nothing is a danger. That's, that's the most important thing. Uh, so that's the day work early section, uh, along with the stitchers who actually repair everything. Then we show up an hour before half hour and we do what's called our presets and we will pack quick change baskets. So if someone has a quick change in the beginning of Act 2, we pack their townsperson costumes, their boots, the socks they need to put on, the hat they're wearing and everything is set up in a certain way so that the armholes are exposed and the skirt is ready to be puddled so it's a quick step in, get the boots on and back on stage they go. So it's a lot of that kind of prep depending on the show. And we also just do kind of general maintenance. We make sure the actors have their show laundry, we make sure nothing uh, nothing's missing and fill a water bottle. So just simple things that are specifically related to the actors we take care of. Simple but not simple. Because <laughs> let me tell you, sometimes I remember having a rip in my shirt or something. Sometimes it will be fixed within 10 minutes or the following day. And honestly, the wardrobe department is so essential to making sure that, making sure that a show runs smoothly and runs period because Everything you need is there for you, specifically placed in a certain way so that you can grab it. Sometimes you have 10 second changes, you know, so it's, it's, she has a very important job. So, as you know, Inside Broadway works with New York City public schools throughout the five boroughs. I think our students would love to know where you grew up. I grew up in Queens, specifically yes. in Woodhaven, but I feel like I've really never left Queens because it was Woodhaven and then it was Elmhurst and now I'm still there. Um, so I've always been a Queens gal. And yet, my, all of my education was in Midtown Manhattan. Like I went to the high school of fashion industries on 23rd. And then for college, moved a little farther east to Baruch, which is also on 23rd. Um, but it's, it's an interesting experience because I grew up in, in New York City, but also on the slightly more sheltered side of things. I didn't play outside all that much. I didn't run around in the parks, and I didn't really explore the city. So I very much stayed to myself, which is probably why I ended up loving costumes so much. Costumes are my friend. Awesome. I grew up actually nearby uh, Cypress Hills, Brooklyn, which is, so my aunt lives off of Woodhaven Boulevard. Okay, we have so much in common, it's insane. And we just met And like we're gonna get ago. into it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so were you interested in theater and costumes growing up, and were you creative growing up? Oh my god, it was all, it was all I had. Costumes, costumes, clothing, design, fashion, that was all I had. Like even from the the very first moments I was drawing and it was it was stick figures, but it was stick figures with like the oval was red and the skirt was a triangle green thing. Okay. And it was stick figures, you know, at, at kindergarten. But 
it advanced from there. Then I was just drawing clothing pieces and then I was doodling like, and this is a three piece suit. And it was all very rudimentary, but I knew what I wanted. I knew that it needed to, to be about the accessories and what each individual piece would look, uh, look like. So that then evolved from, uh, from drawing to watching movies to loving period costumes and everything was opulent. Like I love details, the beading, the trim, the lace, the, the hours and hours of just hand embroidery. And then I discovered Broadway, which is a whole, whole different monster. Like I'm, I am fascinated by the costumes we get to work with because they are so different from any other uh, ready to wear dress you'd ever see. They are different from the Halloween costumes you'd see at Party City. Uh, they're fabulously built. <laughs> All right, that's that's very very true. When I got to Broadway as well, seeing the costumes, like you know, the costume designer would show us their sketches, and I'm like, okay, I know kind of how that's gonna look. No, it's like a couture gown that's one of a kind. Your understudy sometimes uses yours, or you as the understudy. So I understudied Gloria, and on your feet, I ended up having all of my own one of kind because everyone's body is different, of yes. course. But at first, I had to share a couple of things: a jacket. But my best friend Anna, who played Gloria, she's like this, and I'm not. So I had everything custom made to my body, to myself, and I thought that that was incredible because these pieces are expensive and it takes a long time, and you know this is someone's design and someone's work. So it's it's truly amazing. And have you now have you ever in the shows that you've worked on like it's it's very much a simple dress, right, or a simple pair of pants, or it looks like streetwear, but then you look inside it and it's built by like Eric Winterling or Parsons Mears and these are the really big Broadway shops that create these things. You have like the waist belt and then the mm -hmm. snap plackets and then the hooks in the eyes and then the hooks in the snaps and then the zip and the, it's built. It is built to last and that's the reason it looks so good on stage is because it is rigged 10,000 different ways to maintain that, that silhouette. It's incredible, it's incredible. So I know you touched on this a little bit, please tell us a little more about your education and training. So, <laughs> it is, the question that I also get a lot related to this is, where did you study? Like, where did you study in, in college for this? What did you study? Do you have an MFA? I do not, you know, and I, I don't believe that you need one unless your specialty is in dyeing, in, in couture tailoring, in bespoke suits. That's a t totally different story. But I went to, so the high school fashion industries taught us everything from the ground up. Freshman year, we learned how to just do basic sketching. We would learn, okay, these are the different types of collars. These are the different types of sleeves. These are uh, skirt silhouettes. That was the basics. Then our next semester, we learned how to sew with a machine for the first time. So we learned straight stitches and we learned how to do blind hems and they showed us how to do pockets and zippers. So everything that I know how to do, I extrapolated from what I learned in two, two semesters of the basics and then two more semesters of basic draping. So everything, everything was a very thorough education on here's how to build garments correctly. You know, we're giving you all the skills, but for you to get to a point where you can create couture or costumes, that's on you to further your own education. But it was the best thing they could have taught me. So um, I know learning has been very different um, for everyone right now, especially theater students. They're all missing rehearsals and performing on stage. It's awesome that we get to perform on Zoom and on video, but there's nothing like being live on stage and experience, experiencing something live. And I know that a lot of our teachers and students are watching right now, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, can you please tell us about an important theater teacher that you had growing up? I had two, I would say two teachers, plenty of teachers from my school like really, really formed who I am. But like, uh, one of them was my very first draping teacher. So this was sophomore year and she terrified me. It was Miss Singleton, and I, I must I must talk about her and name her because she's unfortunately passed away. Um, but she was terrifying, and I was scared of her. And I was like a straight A student. I was convinced I was going to get like a B in the class. But she had heart like you wouldn't believe. Like underneath the the, the very gruff exterior, 
she cared about her students. And one day, um, a girl had torn one of my favorite t-shirts. I was sobbing because I didn't know, I didn't know how to fix it yet. I was like 14. It's like emotional. And she like stopped everything, you know, took the shirt from me. And she was like, okay, here's, here's what's gonna happen. I'm going to run this under the serger. And then, I'm, you know, we're gonna pin it down so that the seam is right. And you're just gonna take a needle and then slowly, slowly mend this t-shirt. And she calmed me down, but also like, this is a t-shirt. <laughs> and she cared. And that was a moment I was like, there are, there are teachers all over public schools, you know, in New York who give all of the care that they possibly can to their to their students um and so i think about her uh, all the time as well as career wise i had a college teacher a college professor who had a teeny tiny little theater company and they brought me on to do costume supervising and uh, costume design Broadway, off, off Broadway, two of them, is a very, very difficult production to work with because there's no budget at all. However, it is still something that formed my resume, which is why, like, anytime someone asks me for advice, how did you get here? What did you do? You know, it's not a straight line and it's not an easy line. So my first job was, I never got my last paycheck. And that's, that's a reality of it, you know, until you join a union and they fight for you. Absolutely, absolutely. So, now let's talk about what it takes to be a dresser on Broadway. <laughs> so, I know you definitely have to be creative and organized, so what are some other traits or characteristics a Broadway dresser must have? The creative, organized, uh, you have to be a people person, a team yes. player. You, unless you're working on a one-man play, you are going to be working with anywhere from four to 15 other dressers mm -hmm. and then there's two supervisors and then there's the day workers and you do interact with the day workers they don't just come in in the morning and you come in at night you have to communicate with them what needs to be taken care of or addressed or looked at more intensely um, and your goal your goal as a dresser your goal as the entire crew stage management um, stage hands supervise everyone's goal is to make sure the show goes on exactly as the creatives intended. You know, mistakes happen because it's live theater, but it is never the goal to say, oh well, too bad. It's, that wasn't great, but we will make sure it never happens again, or we'll do everything in our power to do our best, because that's, that's what Broadway is. We are supposed to be the best at what we do. And so it's teamwork. You may not like, you won't like everyone you work with. That is, that is a, that is a truth, <laughs> that is a truth fact. Um, and you know, you know that in life, you know that in, in the life, life school, school, everything. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Um, but the thing about growing up and, and having a career as an adult is you have to get past it, you know. Um, I, have, I have someone that I'm friendly with we aren't best friends, but I know that she has my back, um, and I know that I have her back. Like, if we're missing a pair of stockings, if earrings fail to get thrown in the discard basket, one of us will will uh, travel it to the right side of the stage when we have a moment, and that's the importance of all of this. You don't have to be friends, you just have to be functional co-workers that get along. Yes, yes, yes. I guess students can relate in the same way with group projects, right? If there's one person that's slacking, the whole group suffers, you know what I mean? You have to have teamwork, you have to, you know, respect each other and like, let's get the job done, let's get this task done. And especially in my theater, when things are timed, like, well, I, I think I remember in On Your Feet, I was missing something that was on the other side of the stage. Oh, I think there was yeah, a sub dresser, which is okay, right? Like, everyone makes mistakes. Another dresser ran to the other side of the stage and I literally got it within a second of having to get on stage. And that's what it's about. Everyone working together to make sure that the show, the show must go on, right? So that's absolutely 1000% like, yes. Yeah. So now Darcy, can you tell us about a day in the life of Moulin Rouge? You step into the theater, what happens? Okay, so I step into the theater and everyone is presetting. So like the crew has a preset hour, the wardrobe people have a preset hour, and the preset hour is 
when we take our time to make sure everything is ready for the show, that the actors have what they need, and that all of our quick change baskets, and we set them in baskets, it's the most efficient way to do it. And it's a matter of not only packing all of the costume pieces and all of the correct shoes and all of the little earrings that we keep in tub over our boxes just to keep, they're so small. And just to make sure they're all in the correct baskets. And then what happens is we'll bring them up on deck. And you know, sometimes if you're training a swing and a swing is someone who covers you when you're on vacation or when you're away, and swings can also cover multiple dressers tracks. And they'll tell you, okay, so you're gonna take your, your basket and set it on the set piece, but when you come up stage later, you have to move it because that set is immediately going to play. And it's things like that where our preset hour is important because we double check all of our stuff. Are the costumes for the right person? Did we have a switch out because the principal called out and the understudy is on? are all of the shoes correct because all the shoes look the same unless you mm -hmm. you know read the label and read the label a second time uh earrings accessories there are things that just aren't shared some things do end up shared um but most importantly show laundry is not shared so we make sure the actors have that uh, other things that happen during the preset hour we fill water bottles we make sure everything is located where it needs to be some things end the show stage right we bring them back stage left um, up, arms out, because when things get taken mm -hmm. off, it's like, yeah, <laughs> backwards. Um, and then the, I think that about sums up a preset hour. It's it's preset. You preset everything. You prep. And you also sometimes check what the day workers do. And the day workers are, of course, people who have essentially the morning shift. They, they're the ones who uh, steam and prep and maintain and put things back together so you just make sure everything was done right because like with your swing dressers a lot of different people can come through the day work circuit and sometimes they're unaccustomed to knowing what to check for or exactly what to do or whether this even needs to be repaired or if we're just used to this thing being so free. <laughs> Absolutely. And then touching on what we talked about earlier, teamwork and making sure to work together to make sure that the show, you know, runs seamlessly, swings, right? They, it's someone who comes in and subs for wardrobe, for a stagehand, for an actor, right? They don't necessarily do this job every day. So they're looking at a piece of paper that says, move this here, move this there. So it's very, very important as an actor to be mindful of that and be kind because under stress, when you know you have to get on stage again in 15 seconds and the stressor, the swing, doesn't really know what they're supposed to do, just kind of like, hey, I'm supposed to get that, can you please help me put this on? Because again, there some some swings are brand new to the job and they've learned that track that morning or are learning it literally in that second. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, and, and sometimes like you just have to swing. It's a, it's a 20 second change and that's just enough time to do it and breathe a little. Yeah. But if you're a swing, you're like, the zipper, it, the zipper's caught, the zipper's caught, why is the zipper caught? But the regular dresser knows like it's caught because normally I pinch it right here. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing you forget in the heat of the moment yeah. because you have three more quick changes coming up. Absolutely. So can you talk about how you got into the business of theater? It was, um, it was short of a miracle because <laughs> I had given up. I, uh, I started in, I sort of started in bridal. I went to a business college and every, every opportunity that I've had related to fashion and clothing and, and styling and, of course, costume design was something I had to go out of my way to seek out on my own and, and pray that I could kind of rearrange my resume to reflect only the design stuff, only the creative stuff. So I, with the off-Broadway show, the off-off-Broadway show, <laughs> The reason I indicate that is because off-off-Broadway, I believe, is up to 99 seats, and then off-Broadway is up to 500 seats, and then the budgets that. change for that reason. Uh, but having that on my resume got me on the radar of a good stage manager friend of mine who needed a sub for her off-Broadway show called Ruthless, and that was when I had my first uh, wardrobe supervising gig. And I did that for about a month until someone reached out to me from Lion King 
and they said, we are currently in desperate need of swing dressers. And this is, you know, that phrase comes up a lot, swing dressers. When you have a show of 16 people and it's been running for 20 years or like Hampton, 35 years, there's a million swing dressers, but they're always moving on to other things or they're moving out of the country. So they're always looking for new people. I got my foot in the door, submitted a resume, um, and they, they hired me on the spot because they were in desperate need of people. And at that point, it's a matter of, this is my shot. This is, this is the moment where I have to prove myself. And I am terrified because if you've ever seen Lion King, it's <laughs> giraffes on stilts. It is half puppets. It's, you know, these, these grass heads, um, pod dresses. I'm thinking back to all of, all of the craziness. And the puppets count as wardrobes, so you're handling things that aren't clothes. But everyone there was very invested in helping someone get the show going. That's just it. They may not love having to walk you through everything, but they will. And that's the that's most awesome. important thing. Uh, so yeah, from Lion King, I then went to Aladdin, and then I went to Frozen. And with the more networking that you build, you build uh, good relationships with people, people who know that you're an excellent stitcher, that you're an alterationist, that you're great with beading, that you know the garment district, so you can constantly shop for replacement buttons and new fabrics to patch something that keeps tearing. Uh, all of these skills are relevant in some way when you submit these resumes. That's amazing, and it's true, it's about who you meet, networking with them, being kind and respectful, working hard, having a good work ethic, because that's going to launch you to the next and the next and then the next job sometimes. It's not about, sometimes it's not what's on your resume anymore. It's who you know, them knowing your capabilities, them knowing, you know, all your different skills, right? It's important to have different skills. Um, and yeah, that's going to get you the next job sometimes. So that's amazing. Can you talk more about what other shows you've been in and what your favorite show was? I'm not allowed to. <laughs> okay, it's Mulan Rouge. <laughs> <laughs> it's Mulan. Okay, uh, I'll start with Mulan Rouge and then I'll, I'll talk about all the other wonderful opportunities. Mulan Rouge, in this time of pandemic, the producers have been so amazing with communicating with us that we do not feel forgotten. We, we have had conversations about how to continue to create a good broad, Broadway environment and of course Moulin Rouge environment. Like how do we make this better? How do we make you all comfortable and, and safe? That's beautiful. And that is not something you get across Broadway. Um, you know, and I've noticed it because I've worked, I've worked in a significant enough amount of other shows where I don't feel as comfortable voicing um, you know, concerns or things that probably should be addressed. And with them, they, they very clearly care about every member of their company from, from the principals to the ensemble to the backstage dressers to the stage chance to the front of house. And for that very reason, it's, it's my favorite just to show as, you know, as a sentimental thing. Oops. Now, <laughs> now, the shows that I have worked on that have been tremendously fun, Aladdin is another fave. I got to see that one too, that was awesome. I just, you, it's unique, it's unique in that that is the happiest, most warm and welcoming show that I have ever worked on. I got there, everyone was nice, they were literally, you're going to have two quick change parades. My King has no quick change. What is a quick change parade? Explain that, okay. please. <laughs> a quick change is, I think, anything that takes less than 20 seconds. Correct me if I'm wrong. But something, it's something insane. I thought a parade, I'm like, are, do they celebrate? Like, when you <laughs> walk into Aladdin, are they like, quick change? I don't know. I was like, What's a quick change parade? I want to know. It's like, you walk into Aladdin and someone steals your coat off of you. <laughs> so, quick change parade. Um, if you guys have seen that show, it's uh, two... There are two numbers where everyone in the ensemble shows up in one look and then they have something that quickly zips away and tears away. And yes, I remember. Okay, right? okay, okay. And then we, so we have two or three preset baskets for each performer because they, they do their dance moment and then they run off stage and then they get into their next look, new shoes, and then 
run back on, do that thing, and then they come back off for a third time to get into another concert, and this is all in one number. It's <laughs> happened twice. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> now, what show was the most difficult you've ever worked on? The most challenging? Most challenging? After, okay, so after four or five years of working on Lion King, it now has become the easy one, but it's intimidating for a lot of newer people because no one really teaches you in summer soccer, community theater, or, or anything else how to handle a giant anthill piece that she like wears. You know, it's scary. You don't ever want to hurt the actor, and you generally don't when you're just zipping them into a dress or a mm -hmm. shirt or whatever. So it's a matter of paying extra attention to, to the safety of it all and also handling giraffe stills and putting a zebra puppet over their shoulders and dressing them into a cheetah and knowing to hold the pole so it doesn't poke them in the face or smack you. <laughs> it's like there's a whole lot of stuff that you've learned from your fellow dresser. It's like, you're gonna hold this and you're gonna understand why you're holding this while you're dressing them. And on top of that, those uh, Lion King pieces cost a lot of money. So it's very important to be careful while you're learning and, and the actor's moving and you're trying to, it's a lot of pieces. So making sure that you're focused, again, making sure that you're disciplined, like this is, this is what I'm going to do, listening and learning from other people, being open to change. It's very important because it, you're under a lot of pressure sometimes. So, we talked about working in the wardrobe department. Can you please tell us who is a part of the wardrobe department team? The wardrobe department team is usually it's, there are a lot of there are a lot of invisible members um, because I'd say it starts from the very top. You have the main costume designer, then you have the associate costume designer, and usually an assistant and potentially a shopper. So these are the people who are the top down, and the directions all come from them. You have the sketches from the designer, and then the associates kind of help execute, and everyone is commu in communication with the costume shops like Parsons Mirrors, Winterling, and, and several others. And when the costumes are done and they're fitted, the actors go into the shops to get fittings, everything shows up to us, and our wardrobe supervisor and the assistant usually checks that whatever has come, custom fitted or not, actually fits and can play on stage because something that looks amazing and beautiful and worked when they moved around a little in the fitting room suddenly has boning that pokes mm -hmm. in the wrong place or you can't actually raise the sleeve anymore because they, they pulled a dart you know, while they were fitting it. So that's the that's next step in that. It's five people so far. Then you have someone who is dedicated to doing laundry, which sounds simple, but it's not. The, the skin pieces are easy, so tights, underwear, undershirts, bras, that's easy. But we have to wash these custom-made button-up shirts. And then there's a matter of low heat or by hand, and they have to hang over a fan to make sure they dry quick and don't move because they can't go in the dryer. Then you have, of course, the day workers, and there's, I want to say like three to five because they're the day workers who do the ironing calls, then someone takes care of just the principal costumes, then oh, just the that. ensemble okay. costumes. Yeah, so like they, they know what to look for. Instead of giving them a huge array of things to have to, to constantly know, recognize, and be familiar with, it's okay, I know what all of Satine's costumes should look like. I know that she should not have this extra feather trailing, you know, so that's useful to have the continuity. Then after the ensemble, and there's several of them because it's a big ensemble, and uh, depending on the size of the building, it starts in the basement, then it's on deck in the quick change booths, and then a lot of stuff lives in the dressing rooms. So it's a long, it's a long day. Uh, shoe calls are important because as I said, you're checking for rubber not peeling away. Because if you, and you would know this because you dance, right? Mm -hmm. If it's peeling away, that is, that is a disaster waiting to happen. We also check for taps being screwed in, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's safety first. Then cosmetics, we, re, we repaint anything that seems to have worn off. 
Uh, so it's, a, it's both a cosmetic and safety maintenance of the shoes, and we'll bring them out to a cobbler if something intense needs to be fixed. Then, I believe we are on to our dressers. Uh, smaller shows like Dear Evan Hansen, I believe has two dressers. You would know this. I was on the tour, so two, three, I don't know. Oh, very few. Very few. Definitely less than like four or five. Exactly. I so smaller. <laughs> okay, I was like, maybe you'll know because I don't want to say the wrong thing. I was like almost two years ago now. I'm like, I don't even know. It's anywhere from one to 15. <laughs> Uh, straight plays usually just have the one, the one person uh, take care of people. Like I'm sure that that play with Tom Hiddleston and Charlie Cox and um, so three people play probably just had the one person dressing everyone. Yeah, because in plays, again, it's not as big as musicals. I'm, with plays, a lot of the times actors stay on the stage for most of the show, sometimes. But with musicals, it's, you know, a song after song after song. That means new costume, new costume, new hair, new shoes, new everything. Yeah, the musicals love the, 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 the show, the, yeah. the spectacle, you know. That's that's what they're all about these days. So, dressers. Um, Moulin Rouge has nine. Wow. A show like Phantom, Wicked, and Lion King <clears throat> have about 15 to 17. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, because it, it, was, it was set up in a way that... The theater is so big, and the locations of the costumes play a really big role. And how many people have to do double duty? Like, can you be in two places at once, or do we truly need to add another person? Um, so that's what ended up happening with those shows. And it's unlikely to happen anymore, because even a show like Moulin Rouge, which I'd say is a big show, but not gigantic, so we have nine and we have principal dressers, and they specifically take care of the needs of like Karen Olivo and Aaron Tveit, and they, they do a little more than the average because it's built into their contracts as dressers to uh, help them with their family's tours after the show while they get out of costume, um, and help them with whatever else they might need, and that's part of the job description. And then there's the ensemble dressers, and we have a, I just call it a slightly more relaxed go of it. You you prep for your quick changes, you dress your people, you have a nice, easygoing relationship with everyone. Get them on, get the clothes, get everything <laughs> back up, you know. Well, thank you for breaking down the wardrobe department for us. Uh, and again, it's a team of one or like 15 that you need to run a show. And that's just wardrobe. We haven't even talked about the hair department, like oh. electricians, carpenters, stagehands. That's all coming. So in live theater, anything can happen. Like I've fallen on stage, I've been missing a shoe, like anything can happen. What do you do when something goes wrong and do you have uh, an example or a favorite memory of that? Cause they're like, you're ready to throw up when it's happening, but then it's so funny later on that you're just laughing about it. Oh my gosh, I have, I have a few. Um, one of my very favorites was one time uh, all the guys got into their, their little blue jumpsuit moments and they sit around for a bit. And the thing is, they sit around for so long that it isn't until they stand up that they realize something has gone wrong. And this, this one dancer's zipper popped, oh. but there was no time anymore for him to take it off and for me to sew it. So I was like, are you comfortable with me just securing this? Because I don't want this to pop open while you're on stage. And he's like, yeah, that's fine. So I kind of just knelt down and was there with a, a needle and thread. And I was like, you're going to be okay. I'm very good at this. You're not going to get stabbed. And then it just, there was just this thread bar holding, holding the zipper from, from splitting up the top. And then my other favorite was... In Moulin Rouge, one of the one of the characters top of show tosses tosses this cool short like hair skirt or horse hair skirt, and it's very dramatic. So you know he's not looking to to throw it in any specific place. One time, it landed right between the platform and where the platform decreases as they walk down. And we're supposed to go out to get it right as the curtain closes. And by the time I got there, it ate it. This, oh. The platform just ate the thing. I was like, oh no. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. Right. 
did the cue the rest of the same way and then ran downstairs and was just looking at looking at the the under deck portion. Oh my god. I think I see it. I hope it's okay. And then one of the gardeners had to climb up and there's nothing to Disaster. climb. Disaster. There's nothing to climb. He just kinda of, luckily is a great shape. So he like <laughs> retrieved it for us, handed it off, and I was like, this thing is not broken at all. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so can you tell us about what it's like to work on Moulin Rouge, your favorite part, the most challenging part, uh, your favorite costume, your favorite part of the show? Have you ever gotten a chance to actually see the show? Because no. fun fact, a lot of times, look at that, fun fact, when you work on the crew of a show, you don't get to see it. You get to see it from backstage. You get to see some parts because remember, you're doing your job. You have to go. If you're sitting there like watching the show, then you, the person that needs their costume is gonna go <laughs> out without a costume. You know what I mean? So, talk to us about that. And it's and it's most certainly not the same from the screen. So every department has a screen where the show is. You know, is showing right, from yeah. like the uh, not the conductor camp, but the front of house camp. Yes, it's not the same. It's absolutely not the same. And. I never seen the show. I was hoping to, and then a certain shutdown happened. Yeah. But what do I love about this show? Um, there are times early on where fittings need to happen in tech, and it's an emergency, and a lot of things get thrown out the window. So they have the closest person who fits the costume, because the actors are very, very busy rehearsing. Uh, try it on because it doesn't fit on a dress form so I was like okay so I like had my shorts on and my t-shirt on and I put on this sparkle beaded dress to, to, to check and then they lift it up and like, <laughs> broke my heart it's beautiful uh, because we had to check that the lining was no, uh, was no longer see-through and that it was going to keep her her heel from getting caught in all of mm. that hand beaded crazy crazy nonsense um, so that is one of my favorite memories uh, that I can't share pictures of. Oh. What about your favorite costume in the show? Favorite costume in the show? I love... I love... Satine has this... I call it rose gold. It's rose gold. It's got this gritted beaded pattern and I believe it's got... If not, it's her robe, but feathers just flowing down the train, and then she has these sparkle, sparkle glove arm moments, and that is just this va va boom, showgirl, Moulin Rouge, you know, star moment to it. I love, I love that costume. Oh, I got to see that show, and the costumes were incredible, incredible. They're crazy. Uh, so. Darcy is not only in the wardrobe department, she is also a designer, so she designs her own pieces, like again, one of a kind couture, because again, <laughs> one of a kind, if it's coming from here, nobody else has it, so like, she's been designing since she was in kindergarten, doing her stick figures, that's <laughs> insane. Tell us about that, please, what it's like to be a designer, and the difference between being a designer and making fashion pieces, and then the difference with that and Broadway costumes. The, so, I want to talk about like the physical differences because that always fascinated me. Uh, years ago, when I was in high school, I sought out an internship with uh, Parsons Mears, which keeps coming up because it is my greatest internship memory of all time. I've had terrible internships, <laughs> I've had okay internships. That was my greatest internship of all time because they respected me and they actually gave me real, real things to work on. So I ended up doing Wicked costumes and Phantom costumes oh and um, Shrek and Spider-Man to give you an idea of when that was. Awesome. <laughs> I know, I worked on like the Spider-Man mask, which is pretty cool. Uh, Very cool. So the first thing that they were, they were telling us, because I had joined the tour uh, that they were giving a college, was these are built. These costumes are built. They're not just sewn together, but they are built because in order to have a corseted dress, it's layers of canvas and cutile and boning and everything is uh, sealed with hand-stitched bias and this is done by hand and all the appliques are mended on by hand, so everything is by hand or it's hideously expensive $500 yard fabric that was imported from India. Um, crazy, crazy expensive stuff. And they're also, like, if you look at the inside, 
you can see the boning and you can see like a, a two, two and a half inch seam allowance on each side and in every panel that it's realistic for because costumes are not only built to last, they're built to consistently be adjusted to different actors, you know, and there are times where we have no swing costumes, we have no understudy costumes. Can we just quickly take this in in the back and, and, and get them on stage and we have no one else? So the main difference is they are made to be altered and they're made to be last. Then you have fashion. Everything is finished off very beautifully. Everything uh, within a certain price point has linings, they have like, you know, sealed, sealed waistbands. So alterations are a mess to deal with if you really want to. And they give you these little 3 8 seam allowances because they want you to buy a new one. They don't want you to alter it. It's, wow. yeah, it, they're just built completely differently. And of course they're designed differently. And the best, the best thing to compare is a street look in a Broadway costume and then its counterpart from H&M. Yeah, wow. Right. Yes, yes, yes. So now listen to this. Darcy works in the wardrobe department of Moulin Rouge. She's also a designer and she's a stagehand. Let me tell you why this is so important. First of all, we met right before this interview and when I found out she was a stagehand, I was like, oh my gosh, first of all, you're a woman that is a stagehand. We're gonna talk about that because that is incredible. In my experience in theater, I've met three women stagehands and my fiance is a stagehand, and then she knows him because they worked on Lion King together, and he also worked on Spider Man. So, I don't, well, you worked in the costume department. Okay, but please, please, please talk to us about being a stagehand. How did you transition? What do you do? How is it being a woman in this industry? It's an adventure. Ah! It's you know you find the perfect word for it. It's it's such an adventure um, because sometimes you you found your niche. I love costumes, as if, if the last hour hasn't taught you anything. I love costumes, I love clothes, I love sewing things and fixing things and making them beautiful. However, I love learning new things. I love being a part of as many things as I can. So it was starting at Lion King in Wardrobe that I met the, the prop head over there and they needed repairs on, on certain prop pieces that only a seamstress could really do. So I'd been working on that for the longest time. And then I was I was short on work, you know, down the line because it's it's an ebb and flow, feast or famine with our industry. You're always hustling. He goes, do, do you want to learn a track? I was like, do, do you think I can do it? Because frankly, I'm terrified. I moving things. He goes, I know you can do it, just do it. Just just do it. Wow. You know, like and if you say no, that's, I mean, that's your choice, but I don't think you should. So I did that and I've kind of never gone back at that point because I loved it. I just, I loved, I loved working with a different group of people while still seeing my old friends, you know, in the exact same building. Uh, and then from that point onwards, because stagehands are local one, which is a different union from uh, wardrobe, which is local 764. And for that reason, if you do some stagehand stuff, it's in your best interest to pursue the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So he then told me to go out, spread my wings, and think about learning a trade as an electrician and as a sound person. And he told me to go meet X, Y, and Z, so and so, drop off, you know, a little card with your contact information, tell them what you've done, what you're capable of, what skill you have that very few other people have that uh, the stagehand, you know, crew often lacks. And so for about a year and a half, that's what I did. I went to every single wow. theater, introduced myself, told them what I've been doing, what I'm working towards. And sure enough, uh, there were rejections and then there were calls. And then there were some days where several people called me at once. And it gives you, it takes away from that self-doubt that constantly gnaws at you because you feel like you're a girl playing a, a guy's game, but you're getting these calls and they actually, actually want you there. They'll book you for a whole week instead of, let me try you out for a day. 
and all of that just speaks to their their faith in the fact that you can do this that oh my gosh that's amazing that's amazing again whatever you put your mind to you can do you have to put yourself out there you have to trust yourself first and foremost and know that you know your work is valuable that you're worthy and that you are able to do it and again network 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 so can you talk to us about what it's like to not only be a woman in this industry but an asian woman especially as a stagehand because again i've met three women that are stagehands <laughs> two were a uh, carpenter props oh one carpenter two props and neither of them were asian or women of color so can you talk to us about that it's been an adventure <laughs> it's um i have been treated reasonably well like you know the fact that my career has now spanned in, in the stage hand aspect has now spanned two and a half years um pandemic notwithstanding is it's worked out as well as it can but you will still run into a lot of old school thinking and you have to try twice as hard to prove yourself if you even get to prove yourself there and sometimes people will tell you you know what Maybe that's not worth it, but I know the person over at this show that is loading in, mm -hmm. they're looking for people and they'll hire anyone who's willing to work and cares. Like just, you, you just have to be willing, you have to be enthusiastic. And if, even if you can't lift like 50 pounds, how many people really can, you can do something else. They send me into the tiny crawl spaces to, to make connections. And that's that is my that's my selling point. Everyone has something to contribute. Absolutely. Um, it is. Yeah. It's about networking. It's about being likable. It's about letting people see that you're willing to do this. I'm. I'm willing to get dirty. You know. I'm not going to be wearing this dress. <laughs> I hope not. It's cute. I have I have holy jeans for that. <laughs> and now finally, can you talk to us about the different unions? that you are in because wardrobe, as you said, is different from being a stagehand, is different from being an actor, is different than, do designers have their own union? They that do. I don't know. So they're, the designers definitely have a union and so do wardrobe. Wardrobe is 764 and the stagehands are local one. The difference between each union is they're all, they're all under their individual jurisdictions and hair and makeup, of course, has a union as well as the musicians, mm -hmm. as well as the box office people. So it's, oh, all, I know that. it's very many of them, and they're all under the umbrella of IATSE, IATSE. International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. I think okay. I got it. I think I got it. I don't remember what that was. It was a clue on Jeopardy, and I sat there like, oh, my God. oh no. It's a clue on Jeopardy. Um, so everyone has a union, and getting into Local 764 was a matter of doing the work first. So you need to amass a certain amount of, of credit, credited days on a Broadway show or a TV set, because we cover both. So it took, it took a few months to gather the 31 days, because when you're the newest to the team, you don't get all of the work up front, yeah. so there is a lot of free time. And once I got in, you have, uh, you have more contacts. You can attend the meetings. You can you can vote for your e board. Unions are very they're very participant oriented. Yeah. They want you to come to this meeting. They want you to make your voice heard. You know you you pay union dues because it helps to run the office. But they're there for you. Like if something terrible happens, God forbid, at work, they're there to make sure you're not alone. You know, they're, they're there to support you. And I remember learning in school, um, this was 10 or so years ago, I don't know the textbooks have changed and I, I really would love to know, but they painted unions as these horrible things that were constantly trying to, to rob the, the you know, railroad tycoons of everything they had. And the truth is, unions exist to make sure we are not taken advantage of, that we get, enough time for a break because if you work eight hours straight through you will fall apart you you are human you know so 
uh, that's one way that unions in general help us, then getting into Local 1 is slightly different. It's a, it's a more intensive process because a lot of stagehand work is safety oriented. There is rigging involved. There is understanding electricity, voltage, different connectors, not putting something in backwards, um, not running cable backwards, because all of this stuff is pretty permanent for the show run. And that's why it takes three years or an apprenticeship program to really get your foot into that door, but you're learning, you're learning every step of the way, so it's worth it. Absolutely. So as we all know, Broadway has been shut down now for a year and a month. Crazy. Um, so it's been hard to stay positive. What do you do, Darcy, to stay positive? I I've been trying to make the most of this time that I finally have because leading yes. up to the shutdown, I worked nonstop. I was pulling like 60 hour weeks because I was doing both. I had a full time track at Moulin Rouge and I was loading in the Scout Fire and um, American Buffalo up at Circle in the Square. So I was doing double time on the both of those and still also day work at day work, uh, work halls at Lion King. It was a lot. But I also have to fit it all in because the thing is, they keep saying feast, feast or famine, feast or famine, and it's true because all of this work that you have, this overwhelming amount, will end, and you will go three weeks where you get three calls, you know, um, and that's you know that's one of the the things about this industry that we're trying to come to terms with and perhaps fix this constant hustle. So I never had time for my art. I never had time for my design. And when the shutdown hit, and I was looking at at the time four weeks of downtime, I told myself I would start drawing again, I would start making dresses again, I would, I would reconnect with my creative side because it was just on the back burner for so long. So I, I created illustrations for the first time, I designed new bows, I made enamel pins, I did face masks as well. Um, but it was a ton of dresses. It was like 27 dresses is what I wanted to call it because every day to just avoid thinking about, you know, this abyss of mm -hmm. what happened with our industry, I was like, okay, today is the mint dress kind of day. And I once bought this, this little remnant of maple leaf fabric that was like a sheer organza. I'm gonna make a cute little vintage dress out of that. And that's what I kept creating for myself as a goal. And throwing myself into something I loved, even though it was still sewing, still working with, you know, fabrics and costumes, it kept me going for the longest time. Just That's awesome. be an artist, just, just do your best, you know? Yeah. That's true, it's important to be grateful for the time we have now. I know for myself, same thing, you know, we get one day off a week, and you it's may have been working sometimes that, that day, you know, since you were doing a bunch of stuff. So. At first, it was hard to then have nothing, but also, I can't even tell you how many times I cried because I missed Christmases, I missed weddings, I missed birthdays, because you're living the dream, you have a show, you can't take off, and you know, now I have all this time to be with my family, to attend those things, or just to be a part of it virtually, you know, because of the pandemic, and it's so important because for so long, I felt like I missed out on so many things, and now we have all this time. And I am kind of nervous that when things pick back up and Broadway opens again, that I'm, I'm like, how am I going to handle being off one day again and not, you know? And that day is for laundry, for running errands, for running to the bank, you know? Exactly. That's, that day is not really your day. Oof, I know. So, as we finish up, do you have any advice for students and any advice to young Darcy? For students, it is to take every opportunity that comes your way within reason, you know, like use, use your gut, use your brain. Um, but there are opportunities that you kind of want to, you'll feel like you want to turn them down, either because of self-doubt or anxiety or, but this isn't exactly what I want. But every single thing that I have done up till today, this day, has led me here. Even the hardest gig I ever did, where I never got paid, it still, I would not be here had I not done that. 
because I never would have gotten to off-Broadway and that never would have led me to Broadway. And eventually like all of the, all of the, the struggles are worth it, hopefully, but you don't know unless you try. And as far as advice for Young Darcy specifically, I am the master of self-doubt. I don't think I can do anything. I have, I have a cover letter sitting at home where I wanted to submit to a design company. Like, here is, here is how I can revitalize your brand. It's still sitting there. It's been a month. I haven't <laughs> sent it. Um, but it's hard because the self-doubt just gnaws at you. And same thing with, uh, with the stagehand situation. Even though my boss kept telling me, you can do it, I want you to learn a track. I need new subs, new, new swings in my department. You already know these props inside and out. Learn a track. I was like, I bored you personally. Wrong. Do it. Try it. No one is going to yell at you if you don't do amazing the first time. Because no one does amazing mm -hmm. the first time. So take the opportunities. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Darcy Kane, for being here with us today. Thank you to everyone who's watching. I hope you enjoyed and that you learned something from this. And again, continue to chase your dreams. No more self-doubt <laughs> for yourself, for me, for you. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This was amazing. Yay. Thank you.